the, uh, there's something fascinating about Portland because I was here, I think of this group about three or four years ago. And uh, I feel so honored to come back and share with you again uh, some of my research and clinical strategies for trying to avoid the leading killer of men and women in Western civilization that if the truth be known, coronary artery disease is nothing more than a toothless paper tiger that need never ever exist. And if it does exist, it need never ever progress. Now, two years ago, I wrote an editorial for the American Journal of Cardiology. And the title of that editorial was, Is the Present Therapy for Coronary Artery Disease the Radical Mastectomy of the 21st Century? And the motivation for that title was the fact that for 100 years, the radical mastectomy devised by William Halstead at Johns Hopkins in 1882 was the standard operation for breast cancer. And Dr. Halstead was a very revered, powerful figure in surgery, and all the residents that he taught went out to become chairman of other departments throughout the country. And woe be gone anybody who would dare challenge the master's operation. But fortunately, finally, in the late 60s, 70s, and 80s, courageous physicians began to challenge the radical mastectomy. The radical mastectomy not only removed the entire breast, all the muscles beneath it on the chest wall, radical dissection of lymph nodes under the arm, and had to be repaired when it was done, when a Halstead did it, had to be repaired with a skin graft. It was mutilating, it was disfiguring, it was painful, and for many women, they would rather live with their cancer than have the operation. And <clears throat> just in case some of you haven't seen, here is the, uh, some of the original drawings from the uh, picture, and you can understand, I think, how we found that with lesser operations achieving the same result, uh, there was much less reason for women to fear. But we have a better idea, I think, today. Let's try to find a behavior so that we don't ever have to have breast cancer. Now, enough with the preliminaries. Let's start out sort of easy. <laughs> Get you warmed up a little bit here. And let's just suppose that you're a cardiac surgeon and you decide you're going to take uh, your shingle and hang it out in rural China. How about the Papua Highlands in New Guinea? Maybe Central Africa or the Tarahumara Indians in northern Mexico? Forget it! <laughs> you better plan on selling pencils. By culture, heritage, and tradition, they are plant-based. They don't have cardiovascular disease in these areas. However, here you see when I was leaving Vietnam in 1968, this reminds me to share with you that if you were to autopsy our young soldiers who die in Vietnam and Korea of combat wounds, and you look at their coronary arteries, fully 80% of these 20-year-olds will already have gross evidence of coronary artery disease that you can see without a microscope. Not enough for their cardiac events yet, okay? But there it is. And you say, well, it's due to the stress of combat. Well, wait a minute. When you do this autopsy for the Vietnamese and the Koreans, it's not 80%, it was 1% to 3%. So that study was repeated again, all right? It was repeated in 1999, 45 years later. And now what do we see? We're now looking at young women and men between the age of 17 and 34 who have died in this country of accidents, homicides, and suicides. And now the disease is ubiquitous. It's not 80%, it's 100%. In this country, you graduate from high school, you get a diploma, and you also get the foundation for coronary artery disease, okay? Now, how many of you in this audience are over the age of 20? <laughs> Gosh, you know, I've always found it so much more engaging when I'm talking with patients. <laughs> now, four years ago, when I was in Los Angeles, I was moderating a panel. One of the panel members was Lou Culler. Lou is the chairman of public health at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. And on that panel that day in Los Angeles, he made the following statement. 
as a result of his 10-year cardiovascular health study. All males who are 65, all females who are 70, who have been exposed to the traditional Western diet have cardiovascular disease and should be treated as such. We're really doing something wrong. Now, a chance we had to get it right was, of course, during World War II. You may recall, maybe you don't recall, when the Axis powers of Germany overran the low countries of Holland and Belgium and they occupied Denmark and Norway, it was characteristic that they took away their livestock, their animal products, that is their cattle, their sheep, their goats, their pigs, their chickens, their turkeys, gone for their troops. So suddenly now these Western European nations were plant-based. And it was very interesting to look at a report in The Lancet, England's premier medical journal, in 1951 by Dr. Strom and Janssen. What did they find? Looking at Norway, death, death from heart attack and stroke. And what do you find? Here we are, 1927, deaths going up, 30, 1930 going up, 35 going up, 39, in come the Germans, whoop! 40, 41, two. Who knew the Germans were the greatest public health educators? <laughs> We knew that when they sent Hans Diehl over here. <laughs> so, now we've gone through the easy part. Now it gets a little harder and uh, I'll try to work closely with you on this, but we really want to get this right. Obviously on the right here is a seriously diseased artery. You're all probably saying when that finally closes off, there's going to be a heart attack. Well, not so. Only about 10% of heart attacks come from something which is this ugly looking. On the other hand, I want, you to, I want you to look at the left because even those of you in the back of the room will be able to see that which is the absolute guardian and life jacket of our blood vessels. All experts in this will agree to this. That single layer cell lining of our arteries, has, that magic carpet has a name. It's the endothelium, the endothelium, E-N-D-O, T-H-E-L-I-U-M, the endothelium. Now the endothelium has some very, very remarkable functions that we're gonna talk about in a few moments. But first of all, what seems to go astray with the way we eat in this country is the following. Let's suppose, here we are on the left, you decide you're gonna eat a milkshake, a cheeseburger, or some pizza. And what suddenly happens is our cellular elements in our bloodstream begin to get sticky, sticky. Your blood is now, now no longer flowing like Teflon, it's more like Velcro. Your endothelial cells get sticky. Your platelets, your clotting factor, get sticky. Your white cells get sticky, and your bad LDL cholesterol gets sticky. I know you've all been waiting for this. But let's do it together. Up here, this is the work of Peter Libby, Peter Libby from Harvard. And up here, the blood is flowing in this blue. You can see these individual endothelial cells here. Well, we're all gonna work together and start here on the left, and look up here, in the bloodstream, orange, your LDL cholesterol, which now is sticky, and it crosses through the sticky endothelium, so now in the sub-endothelial sub compartment we have LDL cholesterol, which, as the artist has depicted by making it yellow now, suddenly gets oxidized. Oxidized by these nasty free radicals that we have in our diet, and the sub-endothelial compartment cannot abide those nasty oxidized LDL particles, so it calls upon our SWAT team, the white cells, which Peter Libby here has painted blue in honor of Yale. Nice, okay. So, the white cells or the macrophage begins gobbling up like Pac-Man all these nasty LDL particles, and it gets over here and suddenly it is now so chocked full of these LDL particles that we in medicine do what we do so often to confuse you. We change the name. It's no longer 
a macrophage. It's now, well, I call it Darth Vader, but it truly is called the foam cell. Now, what is so nasty about the foam cell? The foam cell now is an absolute cauldron. It's a cauldron of oxidative inflammation, hydroxy radicals, hydrogen peroxide. And what happens is the foam cell manufactures these nasty, nasty chemical substances we call metalloproteinases. It's not on the test. <laughs> Elastase, collagenase, <laughs> metalloproteinases. What do they do that's so bad? They thin out this cap over the plaque. It gets thinner and thinner and thinner until here it's so thin that the shear force of blood racing over that tears it. And now that seminal event has occurred. You now have ruptured your plaque. And here you are with a 30% plaque, which probably many, many, many of you in the audience have today, completely innocuous, not a problem, because 30% blockage is not going to give you any symptoms. You have to be over 75% blocked before you get symptoms. But this now, with the rupture, there's extravasation or the spillage out of plaque content into the flowing blood, which activates our clotting factors platelets. Suddenly, we now start forming this clot over this rupture. And the clot is, in and of itself, self-propagating. So suddenly, bingo, here we are. Now, that artery, in a matter of minutes, is totally blocked. And all that downstream heart muscle has been deprived of oxygen and nutrients. It starts to die. That's the heart attack. The classic that you all are familiar with, perhaps, that beloved TV commentator on Sunday morning, Meet the Press, Tim Russert, working a Saturday afternoon in his office for his Sunday program, ruptured his plaque, and sadly had a fatal cardiac arrhythmia from which the EMTs could not resuscitate him. So, but do you know the exciting thing about this nasty cascade that you see here? There is good news, and that is all I have to do is to convince you that if you simply change your internal biochemistry, it doesn't take a great deal, but it's enough, when you stop injuring that inner layer, that guardian, that life jacket of your blood vessels. You stop injuring the endothelium. You raise that magic molecule that it manufactures, and what happens is you can never rupture your plaque. I'm going to show you today how you strengthen the cap over the plaque. That's how you make yourself heart attack proof. And guess what? There's no shot. There's no pill. There's no procedure, there's no operation. We're going to talk about four defense mechanisms that all of you have, four natural defense mechanisms today that are not being treated with standard cardiovascular medicine. And let me just say at the outset here, I have nothing but the greatest admiration and respect and reverence for the fund of knowledge of my cardiovascular colleagues. But we've been at the same deal treating heart disease now for 60 years, and it's getting a little bit old because it doesn't seem to work. None of it is treating the cause. None of the drugs, none of the imaging, none of the <coughs> procedures, and none of the operations are treating the causation of the disease. And Thomas Edison said that dissent is essential for progress. So let's have a little constructive dissent. All right. Now. This, for years, was a cartoon I had in my presentation. Halfway through his Hardy Man breakfast, Dwayne Feldia felt several of his small arteries slamming shut. No longer a cartoon. Here, forget the x-ray. Just focus on this artery that's just half filled with a plaque, and <coughs> half still open. We used to think of these wonderful endothelial cells up until 1980 as cute little bricks that were lining these wonderful pipes. And then what happened was Dr. Fershgott in Brooklyn, doing experiments with the rat aorta, the largest aorta in the rat, found that when he didn't injure the endothelial cells with a spiral cut and immersed it in saline, the artery dilated. So now the race was on globally. What was this factor that Fershgott had discovered? And he labeled it 
the EDRF, the endothelial derived relaxation factor. Thank heavens, that term was only around for eight years. Because at the end of eight years, Dr. Fershkot, Dr. Murad, Dr. Louis Narrow, 1988, discovered it was a gas, nitric oxide, which we all make. And it has absolutely some wonderful properties. One, a wonderful level of nitric oxide whew, keeps your blood flowing smoothly, like Teflon, rather than Velcro. Number two, nitric oxide is the strongest dilator of blood vessels in the body. You climb stairs, the arteries to your heart dilate. The arteries to your legs dilate. Nitric oxide. Nitric oxide will also prevent inflammation from forming in the wall of your artery, keep you from getting arteries that are stiff, keep you from getting high blood pressure, hypertension. Number four, pretty important, nitric oxide in plentiful amounts protects you from ever developing blockages or plaque. Number five, nitric oxide will prevent migration of smooth muscle from the wall of the artery from growing into the plaque. Number six, nitric oxide may destroy Darth Vader, the foam cell. So there is so much power in that. So I want to show you how to maximize the amount of nitric oxide that is produced. Now, you're probably sitting there saying, gosh, I really wonder what my level of nitric oxide is. Well, it's still a little bit of a research tool, but here's how they do it. First, you take an ultrasound probe, place it over your brachial artery, right? and there on the screen, there's the diameter of your brachial artery. For five minutes, then, you'll have a blood pressure cuff encircle your upper arm. Inflate it above systolic blood pressure for five minutes. Now, <clears throat> I've had that done. It's not exactly habit forming. But <laughs> then you release the cuff and immediately take the ultrasound probe, measure the new diameter of the brachial artery, and in the normal individual, it'll be 30% greater because of that time that the cuff was elevated. The next thing that happened that was wonderful was Dr. Robert Vogel, who was chairman of cardiology at <clears throat> uh, University of Maryland, took a group of healthy young subjects to a certain restaurant which is characterized by arches which are golden. <laughs> the half that had the cornflakes, brachial artery tourniquet test, boop, normal. That half that had the hash browns and sausages within 120 minutes. <clears throat> Those healthy young subjects after that meal could not dilate the artery 120 minutes. That single meal had so savaged, had so imperiled, had so injured the capacity of the endothelial cell to make nitric oxide, they couldn't dilate. But as they followed them a number of hours later on into the early evening, they began to recover. But you and I know, the next morning for breakfast, oh, scrambled eggs and bacon. Lunch, how about some white bread with cold cuts and mayonnaise? Supper time, baked potato with sour cream. Lamb chops, vegetables soaked in butter, ranch dressing on a salad, and ice cream for dessert. Here in America, we just take those lovely little old endothelial cells, morning, noon, and night. We just pound them and we injure them, and then we graduate from high school with coronary disease. Okay, isn't it nice to get it all straight? <laughs> all right, looking at some different diets, here's flow-mediated dilatation, same thing as the brachial artery tourniquet test and sense. The worst diet for that, Atkins, next worst, South Beach. There's the champ, plant-based. All right, let's look at something else. Here's the new kid on the block. The endothelial progenitor cell from our bone marrow is responsible for replacing our senescent, injured, worn-out endothelial cells. And if you were to draw blood on somebody who is obese, 
hypertensive, diabetic, smoker, inactive, the a number of endothelial progenitor cells will be very low. Somebody who's just the converse, higher. But remember, I'm a little bit greedy for my patients. How can I really make the endothelial progenitor cells sparkle? How can I make them sparkle? To do that, we went to a study from Okinawa. You take the healthiest human being on the planet, an Okinawan woman between the ages of 17 and 34. Half of the group gets the standard Okinawan diet, the other half gets the standard Okinawan diet, plus five additional Okinawan green leafy vegetables daily, and at the end of that study period, when you measure the blood level, the level of endothelial progenitor cells is strikingly higher in those who have had the additional green leafy vegetables. So now we've got two things, endothelial cell, endothelial progenitor cells. How about the HDL cholesterol? All right, you've all been hearing how incredibly important it is for years we thought to have a high HDL. The wheels began to come off that a little bit when our early, when our early study, we found that our patients who were eating plant-based not only were dropping their HDL level, it would go below the level of American normal. So here we were with abnormal HDL levels, but they were losing weight, their symptoms were going away, and when we did follow-up studies of metrics, we found that they were reversing their disease. What's going on here? In 2009, the British Journal of Medicine, Dr. Brielle, looked at 300,000 British subjects, 150,000 control, the other 150,000 having their HDL cholesterol artificially jacked up by fish oil, niacin. At the end of the study, they found that there was a 16% greater incidence of new cardiac events in those who were having their HDL cholesterol artificially jacked up. Another bit of insight came in 2006. In 2006, Pfizer was about to release on the public the drug that was going to end all heart disease. It was called torcetrabib. Torcetrabib, half of it was Lipitor, which was their great drug for lowering your LDL cholesterol. The other half was torcetrabib, which would drive your HDL through the roof over 100. The low level for the American normal is 40, uh, for American male is 40. Now, torcetrabib went through its phase one trial with the FDA, phase two trial, fine. Nearing the end of the phase three trial, when it was just about to bring this to the public, the chairman of Pfizer got a phone call from the chairman of the Independent Monitoring Committee. Mr. Pfizer chairman, sir, we have a problem. Okay, what's that? Well, in the control group, there had been 51 deaths, but in the torcetrabib group, there had been 81 deaths. It was killing people, so it was not brought out, and that drug never came along. Since then, there have been other drug companies that have tried the same thing with the same result. So a great deal of insight finally came. In, 19, in 2011, Dan Rader and his team from the University of Pennsylvania did a brilliant study. They drew blood from 2,000 subjects and measured their level of HDL cholesterol. Then they measured the capacity of their HDL molecule to do its job, to efflux, that is to say, to withdraw cholesterol from the periphery in the artery wall and take it back to the liver and neutralize it. And guess what? The blood level of measured HDL cholesterol has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with its capacity to efflux. And as a matter of fact, the very next month, from UCLA, February 2011, came this study. They were looking at UCLA at ApoA1. ApoA1 is the major protein inside your HDL molecule, and the health of your ApoA1 is key to making your HDL work properly. And if you are eating the typical Western diet, you not only are so destroying and injuring your ApoA1 that you now your HDL molecule is no longer an anti-inflammatory molecule working for you. 
it has now become a pro-inflammatory molecule joining with your LDL to injure you. So this business about clinging and having a high HDL is crazy. Because think about it. The Tarahumara Indians, OK, never have heart disease. And I told you the low level of American normal for HDL was 40 for the male. Guess what the level is of the Tarahumara? 20. Five. That'll drive the average cardiologist apoplectic. <laughs> but what a mon monumental 25 it is. Those guys have got, and gals, have got an absolute metabolic powerhouse. All right, so we've done three. The endothelial cell, endothelial progenitor cell, HDL cholesterol, now the fourth. And this one I know you've all been waiting for. DDAH, dimethylarginine, dimethylaminohydrolase. OK? First of all, on the left, let's make it simple. Three things, raw material, arginine, factory, your endothelial cell with its enzyme nitric oxide synthase making the end product, nitric oxide. Raw material, factory, product. Boom, boom, boom. Pretty straightforward. Some of you, I can see you sitting out there saying, gosh, Dr. Esselstyn doesn't realize this. All I have to do is go down to the health food store, buy a jug of arginine pills, and boy, I'll just make more nitric oxide than anybody can imagine. Don't do that. It doesn't work, and it can be harmful. Because a study was done clearly showing that if you give arginine pills, you do pick up additional heart attacks, and that's why they stopped the study. This was 2006 in Journal of the American Medical Association. But let's look at the other side. ADMA, asymmetric dimethyl arginine. We all make this. This is a natural byproduct of protein metabolism, but we don't want too much of it around because, see the arrow, it interferes with our ability to make nitric oxide. So the body has two ways of getting rid of it. One, through the urine, and two, it gets metabolized away by this wonderful enzyme, DDAH, dimethylarginine, dimethylaminohydrolase, and it's a strong enzyme, but it's kind of delicate. Now, the importance of the urine in this is very clearly seen by patients who have renal failure and they're on dialysis. One of the highest causes of sickness, morbidity in those patients is vascular disease. Why? Because they can't get rid of enough ADMA. They really muck up their production of nitric oxide, their great protector. But what about the rest of us who are making normal amounts of urine, good kidney function? Is there anything we do that messes up our DDAH? Yeah. Obesity injures DDAH. Hypertension injures DDAH. High cholesterol injures DDAH. High homocysteine injures DDAH. High triglycerides injures DDAH. Insulin resistance injures DDAH. Diabetes injures DDAH, and so does tobacco, smoking. All those that I've just mentioned, except tobacco, just like the endothelial cell, the endothelial progenitor cell, and the HDL cholesterol, Every one of those, all four, are treated not with an injection, not with a pill, plant-based nutrition. How exciting is that? And it's the same. And we'll get to that as we get into the uh, farther. Now, there they are. These are the four things that are a great protector that are not being treated today by standard cardiology. Whoo! All right, you've gone through the hard part. Now we'll coast a bit. Here we are. This is a summary of what we do in America when we have an illness. Instead of treating the cause, often we'll make a pill. Somebody makes a lot of money making the pills. And the pills here were statins. Now the statins were of some help. Here's a summary of all those statin drugs sort of from 1990s when they came out. 30% fewer new heart attacks, 30% fewer heart attack deaths, 30% fewer interventions. But my question is, wait a minute, this isn't cancer. What about the other 70%? So we do another thing, and that is we operate or we do stents. Now, how many stents do we do? 
1.2 million. What's the mortality? Very small, 1%. Well, what is 1% of 1.2 million? 12,000. So we have 12,000 deaths from stents a year. How many heart attacks while you're getting a stent? 4%. 4% of 1.2 million, 48,000. So we get 48,000 heart attacks while you're getting your stent. A little higher mortality with uh, the operation, but we don't do as many, 500,000. Mortality, 3%. 3% 3 of 500,000, 15,000 deaths with surgery. Same number with strokes. When you're having a bypass operation, you get some strokes. How many? 3%, another 15,000. Let's take it over a decade. 270,000 deaths. That's a little over a quarter of a million. 480,000 heart attacks, half a million, and 150,000 strokes. Maybe we can do better. All right. Okay, now you get a break. This is a little industry out of control. Take a deep breath. This is the French dairy industry. Could look the same in the United States. What does Walter Willett have to say about this, the chairman of public health at Harvard? The current path leads to increasing adiposity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and disability, and an unfit, socially isolated population stuffed with pills and subjected to frequent palliative procedures. All right, here you see what happened after Bill Clinton had his second go-around. This is a surgeon and the president of the American Heart Association, and these are quotes from the New York Times that they made. His surgeon said, this is not a result of his lifestyle or diet. It's a chronic condition for which we don't have a cure. The president of the American Heart Association, Clyde Yancey, this kind of disease is progressive, there aren't any cures. Well, gentlemen, with all due respect, I totally 100% disagree. I'm gonna just, in the interest of <laughs> time, um, I wanna share with you a couple, a couple of studies that I got involved with. Briefly, this was in 1985, and I still was a surgeon with a full-time schedule, and so I could only see about 24 patients in this initial study. And the fact that I only have one woman there, that's just the way they came. You'll see in the second study, we had many more women. There was no malice of forethought here. But what we wanted to do, we wanted to see if we could take these patients who were ravaged with heart disease. My late brother-in-law used to say they were SEs walking dead. They failed their first or second bypass, failed their first or second angioplasty, were too sick for these procedures or had refused. Five were told by their expert cardiologist they wouldn't live out the year. I'm happy to say that those made it all beyond 20 years and all the other patients who were compliant had no further progression of their illness. However, to do that, we want to eliminate all the foods that by the brachial artery tourniquet test are known to injure endothelium. That's how we get these people to blossom. You see, the reason we're so successful with something like poison ivy, we have told the public what is the causation of poison ivy. It is our obligation, and you'll see me, hear me say this time and again, it is our obligation to the public to convey to them what are the foods that cause coronary artery disease. And we get all this business about stress, age, the luck of the draw, genetics. This is a foodborne illness. Yes, there's maybe two or three percent that we can talk to the genes. Now, these are the foods that every time they pass your lips will injure your endothelial cells. Oil. Double virgin, triple virgin, quadruple virgin, olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, palm oil, canola oil. Oil injures endothelial cells. I don't think they heard it over here. <laughs> oil injures endothelial cells. So does dairy, milk, cream, butter, cheese, ice cream, yogurt, and anything with a mother or a face, right? Meat, fish, fowl. For my patients who have heart disease, I'm tough on avocado and on nuts. Now, everybody's gonna say, well, what if they had a little bit of an English walnut? All right? If Dr. Esselstyn ever said that you could have a little bit of an English walnut, I can tell you that is never what people remember. They'll say, Hey, Esselstyn said nuts were fine. 
Did you ever hear of anybody who ate one nut? <laughs> when I was growing up, we had nuts twice a year. They came in a bowl. They had shells on it. And there was these silver pliers. And you put the <laughs> silver plier over the nut, cracked it, and when you're cracking it, you usually cracked your nail and you maybe got a few other things. And after you had to bloodied up your finger a little bit, three or four nuts, and that was enough. Then you did the same thing at Christmas. That was it until next Thanksgiving. <laughs> Nowadays, you want nuts. You go to a gas station. You get some gas. You go in, take care of things. And then uh, so you see these racks, nuts with honey, nuts with sugar, nuts with lard, nuts. <laughs> Not, not a health food. All right. We're clear on that. Now, the other thing that's, that's missing here, and I apologize, this is so important, and this is the work, wonderful work of David Lustig. David Lustig came out of uh, uh, University of California, San Francisco. And he did wonderful work showing us, really in the last two years, how brutally toxic to the endothelium is fructose. Table sugar is half glucose, half fructose. Sugar endothelial cells are injured. That's maple syrup, molasses, honey. Orange juice, agave juice, apple juice. You can eat an orange. You can eat an apple. If you're eating the fruit when the sugar is bound, bye, Hans. <laughs> when you uh, are eating when the fruit and the sugar is bound to the fiber, slow absorption, not a problem. But when you take the fruit, and now you've got fruit juice, you've got fructose. And this is why I've, I'm on record as being so hard on, peop, on uh, my patients. I don't want them to have any smoothies. And I'll get to that in a minute in more detail. Because when you make smoothies, often especially of vegetables, they beat them up with fruit because it's too, a little too tart, and now we've got all the fructose. Totally passes, passes one of the most important parts of the gastrointestinal tract, your mouth. Uh, all right. Now, just for the, in case I thought a few of those in the back didn't get it right, no oil! <laughs> what is this? This is a peer-reviewed article, again, after my book came out. I get another one. Olive, soybean, and palm oil intake have a similar acute detrimental effect on the endothelial function in healthy young subjects. No oil. What are you going to eat? All these marvelous whole grains for your cereal bread and pasta. 101 different types of legumes, beans, and all those marvelous red, yellow, and green leafy vegetables. Now, why is that important? Remember we talked about what's going on in the inside of that plaque. First of all, we've just taken the gasoline out of the fire. But now I want water on the fire. What is water on the fire? If this plaque is comprised of a cauldron of oxidative inflammation, I need antioxidants. No, do not go down to the health food store and buy a jug of pills that says antioxidant. Doesn't work, and it can be harmful. So the way the body knows how to beautifully get and safely get antioxidants is from food. From what food? The food that has a high ORAC value, O-R-A-C-K, oxygen radical absorptive capacity. God, don't you love it? <laughs> what are those foods? Sure, blueberries and raspberries, but the champ green leafy vegetables. Now, how often do I want water on the fire? You say to me, Dr. Esselstyn, you'd be proud of me. I take some spinach, leaves, at supper. Wonderful. You get a couple of drops. Look, I'm greedy for the health of my, health of my patients. So my cardiac patients are asked, at least for the first three to six months, six times a day, I want a green leafy vegetable 
after it's been cooked for five and a half to six minutes, the size of my fist. I want, along, I want it alongside your breakfast cereal. I want another one at mid-morning. I want it again with your lunch and sandwich. I want it again at mid-afternoon. I want it again at dinner time. And I just adore it when you have that evening snack of kale. <laughs> now, how are you going to make this be delicious? Wonderful, because often when you cook it, some of this fresh kale is just absolutely spectacular. But if you'll go to the internet, go to Google, the olive tap, the olive tap will sell you these exquisite balsamic vinegars. And you put several drops on that green leafy vegetable, and you'd swear you were eating a hot fudge sundae. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got that straight. Now, what are the green leafy vegetables that you're going to eat for variety? Bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard green beans, mustard green, turnip greens, napa cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, parsley, spinach, and arugula, and asparagus. And I'm out of breath. So. Now, that's not the end of that story, because I've told you about how important nitric oxide is. Now, here's a little sad note. By the time you have somebody who's 50, and they are absolutely beautifully healthy, the amount of nitric oxide that they can make from their endothelium is 50% of what we could make when we were 25. So does that mean that the old carcass is letting you down? No. We have another avenue to make nitric oxide, the gastrointestinal tract. How? If I can convince you to chew, this is another reason why we don't use the smoothies. And if I can get you to chew nitrates, how do you chew nitrates? I'm going to give you six. Kale, Swiss chard, arugula, spinach, beet greens, and beets. When you chew, the, chew those nitrates, those nitrates will mix with the facultative anaerobic bacteria that normally lodge in the crypts of our tongue. Those bacteria will reduce that nitrates to nitrites. So when you swallow the nitrites, your gastric acid in your stomach will reduce the nitrites to nitric oxide, which can now enter your nitric oxide pool. And the nitrites in your stomach, which are not converted, farther down the gastrointestinal tract will be reabsorbed into the circulation. And when they reach your salivary gland, they will be concentrated 10 to 20 fold. So that every time you now chew your food additionally, your salivary glands are contributing nitrites, which when they enter your stomach add again, to the nitric oxide pool. How's that for excitement? All right. No oil! All right, so our group started with a cholesterol of 237, and over the next 5 and 12 years, they kept it wonder well down, under 150. Here was their LDL cholesterol averaging around 80, which was fine. Remember, this group was not eating anything that would adversely impact your endothelium. What I'm about to show you now is several angiograms of their arteries showing some reversal. These angiograms were reviewed in triplicate in the Cleveland Clinic Angiography Corps laboratory so that when I, by senior medical technicians that do this all the time for national medical trials, so when I give you a certain percentage of reversal, I know that it's accurate. Here we have a 67-year-old pediatrician. This is the left anterior descending coronary artery to the front of the heart. Here it is, 10% wider over here. That's as small an improvement as your eye can see. A little easier to see in this 58-year-old factory worker. This is looking at the circumflex artery that goes to the back of the heart. And this was described as a 20% improvement from here uh, over to here. On the other hand, that was now the right coronary artery in a 54-year-old retired security guard. 
and this was pronounced to be a 30 percent uh, improvement. Now you already know a lot more than many physicians who still claim that with nutrition you can't reverse heart disease. They just haven't uh, seen this, nor have they read the literature. On the other hand, we have one more. My young colleague, Joe, he's in my book, and in 1996, this 44-year-old young surgeon replaced me as the chairman of the Breast Cancer Task Force. He had a cholesterol of 156. He was not a smoker. He exercised regularly. He was not diabetic. He was not hypertensive. He had no strong family history, but he got chest pain. Cardiology worked him up. In October of 96, found nothing, nothing. So on the third week of November, he had finished his surgical schedule, and he was now writing postoperative orders. Got a splitting headache immediately followed by crushing chest pain, pain in his left shoulder, arm. Joe was having a heart attack. Whip down to the cath lab, start the catheterization, cardiac arrest, resuscitate, finish the catheterization, another cardiac arrest, resuscitate. Then he stabilized, and three days later he was discharged, but he was very depressed. And he was depressed because on his angiogram, the left anterior descending artery to the front of the heart was so, the lower third was so moth-eaten and diseased, they just couldn't jam in stent after stent after stent. It was too far down the artery to have a bypass, so he thought they couldn't do anything for him. They were very depressed. So Ann and I had uh, Joe and his wife two weeks after his heart attack out to our house for, for supper. And the uh, conversation went a little bit like this. Come on, Joe, look, you've been eating this horrible Western diet. You've got this typical Western disease. Why don't you think about going plant-based? We've got 10 years of data. OK. They couldn't offer me anything else, S. I'll give it a shot. But I'm not taking any of those statin drugs. I don't trust them. I hear there may be too many side effects. Fine. It's your call. He became the absolute personification of commitment to the plant-based diet. Over the next 30 months, his total cholesterol went from 156 to 89. He was like a rural Chinese. Bad cholesterol went from 98 to 38. And then, two and a half years after his heart attack, he had another angiogram. All right. And up in the surgical suite, our offices are three doors apart, and I found myself at noontime of the day that I knew that Joe had had his follow-up angiogram earlier that morning. At noontime, I went over, opened the door to his office. There he was, sitting behind his desk. Well, Joe, he had the old follow-up angiogram. Mind telling me, how did it go? He got up from behind the desk, came around, put his arms around me, a couple of these things. He said, I think we're doing OK. I said, well, uh, good. Any chance that I could uh, see the <laughs> angiogram? And uh, while this isn't gonna hap is not going to happen every time, it is a profound statement for, especially in the younger, softer plaques, when you just get it right, how powerful the body can be in wanting to write to write the ship. Now, despite my spark sparkling personality, there were <laughs> six of our original group. I knew within the first two or three months that these guys just weren't able to do it. I had no money for this study. So I went up to them, I said, look, I, you're, you're perfectly free. I'm going to release you full time to your expert cardiologist. I'll just peek in to see how you're doing from time to time, but no obligations to the study. And lo and behold, after 12 years, of those six, two had died, and the other four had to have additional bypass surgery. On the other hand, for the 18 that were sticking with the program, I wanted to know how many cardiac events that they had had in the eight years prior to coming into the study while they were in the hands of expert cardiologists. And they had these 49 different events, as you can see, scattered among these various categories of 
worsening disease. Now, once they came in onto our study, over the next 12 years, we found that 17 of the 18 had no further events. We did have one little uh, sheep who, uh, after six years, wandered from the flock, <laughs> got into the lamb shops, milkshakes, glazed donuts, <laughs> got angina, had the bypass, now he's back with the flock, but he proves the point that I'm trying to make with you today. Now, here we are, I can, we're just about right now submitting for publication this group of over 200 patients. This is not a small study now, it's gotten to be quite large. And I'll just show you a few points because of time. What has happened here is that people wonder about our ability to get compliance. And we're running about an 89.3, almost 90% compliance with these patients. Why does that happen? Well, first of all, <clears throat> when you think about it, it's sort of a pre-selected group because these are people who have seen the movie Forks Over Knives, or these are people who have read our book, or others' book who mention what we do, or by word of mouth. And uh, they've usually had a cardiac event, and about 85% of them are from outside of the state of Ohio. We know that they cannot come to Ohio to the Cleveland Clinic for days at a time. So about a little over 12 years ago, we devised a very intensive counseling seminar. Because if you were going to get patients to comply, I think one of the first things you have to do, you must show a patient respect. The only way that I know to show a patient respect is to give them my time. And this counseling seminar is five hours. I do it with usually groups of 12 patients with their spouse. We insist they come for free. And everybody gets an understanding of what it is that they've done that is the causation of this illness, and also precisely what it is that they must do to halt and begin to reverse this disease. We give them a very hefty notebook with a copy of every one of my PowerPoint slides, several of the scientific articles, a 44-page handout that has many additional recipes that joins with 150 in our book, which they also get. And then they have a marvelous presentation from a woman who's had 28 years experience acquiring and preparing plant-based foods, reading labels, dealing with restaurants, dealing with travel. Then we give them a DVD of the entire intensive counseling seminar that we filmed from an earlier session, so they'll have something that they can always refer back to if they've forgotten. Uh, then we usually have a testimonial from someone who is local or regional who's had a previous successful experience so that those in attendance can say, if he or she can do this, I can do it. And <clears throat> then we have this delightful plant-based lunch. We answer questions and stay in touch as necessary through email or phone call. And what really counts are the results. And what I'm going to show you here are three major cardiovascular studies in the literature, well known. This is the Mediterranean study. And the recurrence rate of major cardiac events, death, heart, death stroke, and heart attack, 25%. The natural history of coronary artery disease, this is out of New York City, New England Journal of Medicine, December 2010. And this is Bill Bowden's famous uh, Courage study. You can see the average recurrence here is about 20%. Then we come over to our group treating the cause of coronary disease, 0.5. That's a 40-fold difference. Pretty, pretty exciting. And <clears throat> I think that when you look back to what happened with the procedures and the present approach, compare it with the nutritional approach, there is no mortality from the diet. There is no morbidity from the diet. And all that happens with the passage of time are the benefits in, in, uh, improve. Now, there has to be a word here about expense. The present <clears throat> situation that exists, this country is being pulled into debtor's prison faster than anything by the entitlements, Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare. But the big kahuna here is Medicare. What is 45% of Medicare? Cardiology. 
What is cardiology today? All our tax dollars, almost trillions going into cardiology. Cardiology today, you get your first stent, your second stent, third stent, fourth stent. Then you have to have a bypass or two. Some more stents, then you're told, can't have any more of these. Now you go into congestive heart failure and you die. From what? A completely benign foodborne illness that has never been treated. So cardiology today consists of enormous expense, uh, none of which is treating the cause of the illness. And it's interesting, I was reading the New England Journal of Medicine editorial sort of section a week or two ago, and I came across a couple of, uh, an article on medical research and its funding. And they referred to an article out of Chicago by doctors Murphy, no, not doctors, but economists, Murphy and Topel. And they estimate that if we can eliminate coronary artery heart disease deaths, we would save the nation $48 trillion. Kind of exciting. Uh, <clears throat> now, there's, there's another gift in here. Nobody is more at risk for having a heart attack than somebody who's already had a heart attack. And here these poor souls are walking around with a sword of Damocles hanging over their head, wondering, when is the next event going to happen? Guess what? Nonsense. You eat this way, you strengthen the cap over your plaque, it never has to happen. Never has to happen. They are so empowered. And contrary to what people say that, oh, patients won't follow this, we find it's nonsense. We find that patients rejoice when they fully understand that they themselves can now become the locus of control for halting this disease that was trying to take them out. All right, let's wrap it up. We uh, got to get out of here by midnight. <laughs> okay, what's the good of having a great heart if your brain is going to go out on you? We know that by age 85 in this country and in Sweden, 50% of 85-year-olds have dementia. Not a good plan. All right, we got a great deal of insight into this when we learned from Megan Leary and her team from the West Coast who reporting at the stroke meetings in Miami in February of 2001, they had looked at over 5,500 MRIs of the brains of Americans. This is a normal one, nice, uniformly dark. What do they begin to find at age 50? Little tiny white spots begin to appear. What are these little white spots? These are little strokes, right? Yeah, you're sleeping, playing tennis, driving a car, zappo. Big brain, tiny stroke, not a problem. But you're no longer 50, now you're 65. And, whew, more often than before, you find yourself saying, <clears throat> sweetheart, where'd I leave the car keys? <laughs> Come on, that happens, right? Now you're 75. Sweetheart, where'd I leave the car? Now you're 85. Are you my sweetheart? <laughs> so we really, uh, you don't suddenly get dementia when you're 85. You work hard from the time you're probably four, five, six, or seven. My suggestion is to those of you who are here and can understand what I'm saying tonight, <laughs> Start tonight, kale. <laughs> because I counted these once. 90. Can you imagine a nerve going along a passageway and suddenly hitting scar? I better go to the right scar. I better go to the left scar. Doesn't work. Wouldn't you just love to do these on all the members of the United States Supreme Court? <laughs> <clears throat> we talked about the brain. We've talked about, oh, one other thing on the brain. Don't despair if you're becoming more senior. You can enlarge your brain as you get older. Yes, how do you do that? Exercise. If you're gonna walk, you gotta be fast enough to, to kind of almost break a sweat because you can enlarge two areas of the brain. The hippocampus, memory, the frontal lobe, executive thinking, 
How exciting is that? Yeah, great. All right, talked about the brain, talked about the heart. Now, what about the leg? I don't know if you can see it back there. This is a little, but one, uh, one of my patients, when he first started seeing me, had to stop five times crossing the skyway to my office because of pain in his calf, because he had a partially blocked artery in his thigh. Sent him over to the lab, and he had a pulse volume done. Rather, very modest at his right ankle. Forgot all about his leg. I was so focused on his heart. Eight and a half months later, he came to me, Dr. Esselstyn. Remember, when I first started seeing you, I had to stop five times crossing the Skyway to the office. Yeah. So you know, this last month, it got to be four times. Then it was three times. Then it was two times. Once. He said, I don't stop anymore. My pain is gone. OK, back you go down to the vascular lab. Here it is, double what it was when he came in. And the reason this was a, such a ter ter terribly exciting moment for me was the first demonstration we had, this was within 15 months of starting the study, study. We had a very clear demonstration of the power of food and food alone in reversing this disease because this is what we call in medicine proof of concept. And we had the measurements to prove it. What was so exciting about this is there was no statin drug. Remember? Statin drugs weren't invented until well into 1987. This was in 1986. So I've given you two examples tonight for if there are patients out there who, don't, who refuse or can't take statin drugs, if you do this and do it right, your disease is history. That's exciting. So this happens to be a 78-year-old uh, <clears throat> chemistry, high school chemistry professor in his retirement. He and his wife just loved to do these fast square dances. But when he was doing fast square dances, he began getting pain in his calf. He saw vascular medicine. They imaged it. He had a horrible aorta and right and left iliac down to his legs. They devised a $70,000 operation, which he wasn't too keen about. He went to the internet. We found each other. He came and said, Dr. Esselstyn, if I do your program, how long before I could get rid of this pain? So I looked at him with great wisdom in my eyes. <laughs> said, probably about eight and a half months. Three months later, I got a phone call. Dr. Esselstyn, you do not speak the truth. The pain is gone. Guilty. Now, we talked about the brain, we talked about the heart, we talked about the leg. Now, just finally, something for the boys and for the girls. When you're watching in Portland some television, athletic event, soap operas, I suppose, uh, news programs, the preamble to many commercials will go something like this. When the moment is right, will you be ready? <laughs> <clears throat> Now, <laughs> we do know in our anatomy, the penile arteries are tiny threads compared to the size of the coronary arteries so that not infrequently before somebody comes down with heart disease, they will find that they are no longer able to raise the flag. However, all is not lost because not infrequently after I've counseled somebody, I'll get a phone call nine or 10 months later, Dr. Esselstyn, yes, this is Mr. So-and-so. Oh, yeah. He said, you know, I thought I ought to give you a call because lately something has come up. <laughs> <clears throat> and I'm wondering if I owe you another check. <laughs> All right. Now, how fast in the heart can this work? This is a PET rubidium dipyridamol scan of the heart. That is to say, we've labeled the red cell. And if it is yellow or orange, you're fine. But here in the middle where it's green, it's got a poor blood supply in this 58-year-old school bus driver from Youngstown, Ohio, who came in with a cholesterol of 261. I counseled him an hour after he had this scan. 10 days later, his cholesterol is 126. And then we got another one of these six weeks later. It's all back. Well, what's going on here? We know we didn't wash out the blockage or the plaque that fast. But from what you've learned tonight, you're going to tell me that the reason this happened 
he has increased his nitric oxide, the strongest vasodilator in the body. So once again, the normal vessels in the heart have enough nitric oxide so that they can dilate and respond, and even those that are diseased can dilate. If you recall in physics, Poisset's law of flow through the hollow viscous is related to the fourth power of the radius translation, tiny increase in diameter, huge increase in flow, angina goes away, and things, wonderful things begin to happen. So in, in wrapping up, why am I so passionate, even now, over 10 years since I've retired from surgery, why am I passionate about medicine like I have never been before? Because of the realization that we are truly at the cusp, the cusp of what could be a seismic revolution in health in this country. And that seismic revolution of health in this country will never come about through another pill. It'll never come about through building another cardiac cathedral. It'll never come about through another procedure or another operation. The seismic revolution that is in our fingertips will come when we in the profession have the grit, the determination, the integrity, and the will to share with the public what truly is the lifestyle and the nutritional literacy that will guarantee for them some freedom from these common chronic killing diseases that they never, ever exist. Example, this is a friend of mine, Dave Schumann from the Worcester branch of the Cleveland Clinic, gave me this slide. Man with diabetes, blood sugar's up here all over the place, goes plant-based, immediately blood sugars come down into a much more acceptable range. I saw Dave the other day, he said, I gotta get you a new slide. This guy no longer has diabetes. Frequently happens. Here's another of his patients. This woman, osteoporosis, urinary calcium should be here in the blue. Here she is peeing away her bones. She's living on meat and dairy, all that high animal protein. And finally, he convinces her to go plant-based. Within one week, one week, urinary calcium is back here in the normal range. What an exciting way to begin to protect your bones, right? So, this is not Hans Deal. It's Peter Spandalo. <laughs> Actually, then, in the 1920s, he was known as Joe Berlino. Joe Berlino, I use this because I don't want anybody to even dream of asking me, where am I going to get my protein? He and his mom were plant-based from the old country. Here he was, a strong man at Coney Island, 1921, 635 pounds with one finger. Put a spike in his teeth, Bennett. And lo and behold, here he is on his 103rd birthday. No cane, no eyeglasses, no hearing aid. And on his 103rd birthday, he put a spike in his teeth, Bennett. Now, for many years, I was on the eighth floor of this building at the Cleveland Clinic. I think you can see from these trees what it's like in Cleveland in February. <laughs> However, now that I work at the Wellness Institute, things are a little different. Uh, the budget is more modest, but the morale is high. <laughs> <clears throat> and if I've learned anything in the last 51 years. Actually, I came to the clinic in 1961 as a rotating intern. And uh, after I got back from Vietnam in 1968, I joined the staff in January of 69. Uh, but what I've learned is that while brains are important, nothing, nothing is as important as persistence. Persistence, 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 best exemplified by this young damsel, Life Magazine, 1939, trying to learn how to do the splits. It's tough to learn to do the splits, but she stuck with it. The other day, downtown Portland, <laughs> she got it right. <laughs> well, what I wanted to say in conclusion is that I think I've uh, messed this up, but I'm going to make it up to you in just a moment. And that is, uh, 
If we look at presently at cardiovascular medicine today, never mind. <laughs> if we look at cardiovascular medicine today, our present approach with the leading killer of women, men, and Western civilization, our present approach cannot cure people. Our present approach cannot ever end the epidemic. Our present approach is absolutely, totally, financially unsustainable. Number two, it is totally a mistaken belief to sell patients short that they won't make this lifestyle change. We have now shown this in close to 500 patients. They rejoice when they have the opportunity to be empowered to stop this illness. And number three, I think it's totally unfair of me to ask the cardiovascular medicine community to shoulder this burden of lifestyle transition. I think they don't have the time, they don't have the passion, perhaps, and maybe they lack the skill set. We want to work with them synergistically in the spirit of cooperative endeavor to show patients a lifestyle of plant-based nutrition where they don't ever have to have this disease, or if they have it, they can hold it and reverse it. And finally, I'm unflinching about this. I think it is absolutely unconscionable not to at least mention this option to patients, and I thank you. You want me to take some? Yeah, sure. Take okay. Some. Mm. <laughs> I'd be happy to try to answer any questions. Wow, I really, I really got it across. <laughs> yes? Good question. It comes all the time. Will plant-based nutrition uh, be a, some, a way to answer the valve disease, aortic stenosis, aortic insufficiency, mitral stenosis, mitral insufficiency? I think it'll help the heart, but it's been totally unfair of, you, of, unfair of me to tell you that I know of studies with plant-based nutrition which have helped the valves. It's much more of a mechanical problem rather than a metabolic problem. One more. Who's brave? <laughs> yes? Nuts and seeds. I think I answered the one about nuts. I, I will, no, I'm okay with seeds. If, you get a, if you've got a a bun that you're going to put a, a uh, come on, what's that great big mushroom that we all eat? That's portobello. If you're going to have a bun and put a portobello mushroom in it, and the bun happens to have those little sesame seeds stuck in it, that's that's fine. And I and I'm, I'm a, I encourage people to eat chia seeds on their cereal because it's a great source of omega-3. Of course, all of you will be eating so many wonderful green leafy vegetables, you're not going to be short on omega-3, but that's another seed that we like. Flaxseed meal. Meal, not oil. Flaxseed meal. Okay. Yes? Well, no, if you don't have heart disease, I don't think it's that necessary. Absolutely no. What we... Uh, we try to get, Ann and I try to eat a lot of green leafy vegetables, and she had her omega-3 check the other day, and she was, phew, she was way out of, the, out of the range. She was very high with her, her omega-3. But um, for patients who have heart disease, there's no question. See, I'm after that plaque, which is the inflammatory cauldron, and I want all those wonderful antioxidants, and I want it just absolutely flooding. 
Nobody has ever gone to the emergency room in, in Oregon with an overdose of green leafy vegetables <laughs> from, too, from too much riboflavin. No, it doesn't happen. When you eat things as grown, the body has this wonderful wisdom of knowing how to protect you. Sir. Before it stabilizes? We think, I think you're asking how long before I can be sure that my plaque won't rupture. We think it in three weeks. Yes, in the gray in the back. Well, what we do, almost all of our patients from, obviously are from out of state. The question is, how do you deal with blood pressure and how do you deal with medication? I really don't deal with the medication, and I'll tell you why. First of all, with 500 people, from all over the country, it would be absolute chaos. They've got wonderful, caring primary care physicians and cardiologists who, working synergistically in the spirit of Cooper Endeavor with us, will, as we get them to follow this dimension of their care, as their weight comes down, as their blood pressure comes down, as their cholesterol comes down, as their blood sugar comes down, the diabetic, then they are more than happy to have their work this out with their family physician or their cardiologist who will then diminish progressively in a safe way the medication that they're taking. Thank you. Sir, can you prevent Alzheimer's disease? Good question. Uh, I don't know of a real study on this except that what I was showing you earlier was vascular dementia. Okay, And that's a little different than Alzheimer's disease. But there is information to suggest, and many people who are expert in Alzheimer's disease feel that if you will eat to save your heart, that you will also have your greatest opportunity for saving yourself from Alzheimer's disease. Now, Alzheimer's disease happens to have these neurofibrillary tangles and this rogue protein called beta amyloid, which begins to get all over the brain. And the Mayo Clinic did some interesting study, uh, I think two years ago, and they were able to harvest human brain endothelial cells. I'm assuming they did this at the time that they were operating for brain tumors. But they cultured these human brain endothelial cells, and as they got them to grow in this culture, not, not surprisingly, they found that the level of nitric oxide was increasing. So then they inserted a uh, molecule that would interfere with nitric oxide synthase, the enzyme in the endothelial cell that's responsible for making nitric oxide. And now the preparation, they began to see the nitric oxide level fall. And as it was falling, on the scene appeared this new bad boy, Base, B-A-C-E, beta site amyloid precursor protein, uh, protein cleaving enzyme. So what was left was that this rascal was cleaving this amyloid precursor protein, and there you had beta amyloid. So what's the deal? You keep the nitric oxide level high, and you keep the bad boy out. I think, there were, I think that was it on the questions. No. Yeah. Done.